Well, good day. Glad you could join as we uh, open our Bibles again to Philippians. Uh, we're going to pick up in our study in Acts again and uh, very soon upcoming podcast. But um, last time we were in Philippians chapter 4, looking at the peace of God that passes understanding, guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I had connected it with um, just the concerns over, you know, um, elections and making sure we find our anchor truly in him in the midst of however things go. And then January 6th happened. And um, wow, just an interesting bit of history and chaos and stuff all happening. And didn't realize um, how unsettling of a day that was actually going to be when I um, had kind of spoken to some of those things. But um, having spent time considering the peace of God last time, uh, I found myself um, uh, in the book of Philippians a little further, and, and I thought it would be of value to go back today even a little deeper into the letter uh, and in chapter 3. Um, you know, for whatever you might have seen in the events that unfolded on, on, uh, on uh, January 6th with um, the protesting at the Capitol, uh, the breaching of the Capitol doors and people getting inside and um, and disrupting Congress and all the different things that were happening, people from different persuasions are going to see different things in that event. And uh, I'm not really going to dive too much into that because all of us will have our views and opinions on that. And, and um, I will just simply interject one thing that I, that I would say above all other things that I saw in that. And that was a further justification of a perspective that um, that I think that all believers need to have. And that is a perspective that is anchored in the basic, simple premise and promise of the coming kingdom of Christ and how far above everything else that expectation needs to be, how deeply that perspective and expectation needs to inform our interaction with our daily living in, our participation within this world. Um, and I've never been more sure of that than I am right now. Uh, you know, in my mind, seeing sort of the, uh, the, the events that took place there just remind me of how fragile things can be, how quickly things can become chaotic, how divisive people can be over things, how people... Um, really need to be able to, uh, Christians I should say specifically, believers, followers of Jesus, those who are living in the expectation of his coming for us as his bride, but also ultimately then his establishing of his kingdom. As we again have so often said in recent days, when Jesus invited his followers to pray, uh, your kingdom comes, you know, calling out to the Father whose name is hallowed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, that perspective, it's almost as if the events of our day, whether it's, um, whether it's disease, whether it's uh, riots throughout the summer, whether it's people storming the Capitol a couple of days ago, it just seems as though the events of our day are driving Christians. And God help us to be mindful and aware of this. Uh, in my view, these events seem to be just driving us toward the further embracing of that expectation of Jesus coming. Um, you know, there, there can be no solid sense of footing or, or hope in, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the kingdoms of this world, no matter what kingdom it is, whether it's uh, here in America, in the West, or anywhere else. The only answer for a society in utter growing chaos uh, and even in our attempts to try and normalize things and bring them back to some kind of a center, it's a good attempt in some ways, but it can only do so much. Ultimately, at the end of the day, Jesus knew what he was saying when he told his followers to pray for the coming kingdom of God. Uh, and, and as believers, we need to embrace that. Uh, with a single-mindedness that is absolutely undistracted, unwavering, and unshifting. And so with that in mind, um, I, 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 I want to bring a pass, uh, to kind of bring our attention to a passage today 
that speaks to that kind of single-mindedness. And it comes again from Philippians. Paul, who's writing these things in chapter three, in particular, we're gonna stop, uh, we're gonna pick up, I should say, uh, in, in the, about the middle of verse 13 there. Um, but Paul has just been talking earlier in chapter three, just a few verses earlier, about his deep, all-encompassing desire to know Christ not just to know about him, not just to be aware of certain things, but to know him in the power of his resurrection, even if necessary, being conformed more and more to his death. In other words, he wants nothing to stand in the way of his getting to know Christ, and he is willing to go through whatever it takes to know him and to know him well. And this is really uh, what feeds these uh, words that follow just a few verses later. Beginning here, uh, about midway through verse 13, I'm going to jump in where Paul says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, pressing forward toward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, One thing I do. I've shared this before, but if you look at the etymology of the word priority or the history or where the word priority comes from, what it's rooted in, Uh, The word priority in our culture is generally uh, used to describe a list of things that are most important. Uh, We have these priorities. Uh, We are going to do this, 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 and this. These are our priorities. Um, But the word priority really didn't come into usage in terms of plural until much after, long after the word was first um, basically developed. The word spoke originally of a priority, a single priority, one thing that is above all others and behind which all other things fall. This is the priority and everything else needs to either fit into that or it goes. That's the kind of thing that is going on in this passage. That is the mindset that Paul brings to this one thing I do. I press on toward the goal. What goal? The goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, which is directly growing out of this desire, this priority to know him. This need to know him then finds expression through the idea of pressing on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do. And in order to say that, in order to do that, in order to express the true sense of what that's all about. It means, again, that all other things that might become part of how we accomplish this must fit that priority. All views of all other things must fall behind this. Uh, As a matter of fact, if there's other things that I need to do or want to do, they will come later if there's time, because right now, this is the thing. And so again, Paul's, Paul's priority here, this one thing, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, okay? Never mind what took place before, never mind what, uh, what other things may have seemed important at the time in that. This is the thing now that I do, this one thing. I'm forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, driving forward, putting all of my effort into reaching this goal. There was uh, years ago, um, gosh, I think it might have been right, I forget what year it was, whether we had moved here already, I think we might have just moved here to Tennessee, but uh, the Titans had, a very young franchise, had gotten to the playoffs and was within reach of getting to the Super Bowl, I think it was. I don't think they were in it, I think they were in the last playoff game to get to the Super Bowl. And the last play involved a player just holding the ball. Uh, you know, I can't remember if it was a, a, a pass caught or if it was a, a running back tr- getting through, but he was holding the ball and he was str- he just reached across, the, tried to reach the ball just across the plane of the end zone in order to get that score that would ultimately send them to the Super Bowl. And the picture in the paper captured it beautifully. There he was, arm extended, guys tackling him down, and he was reaching with all his might to get the ball just across the plane. Didn't get it, though. But every ounce of energy he had was expended in that last push to try and get across the finish line, the goal line, the end zone. And, uh, and it was such a beautiful picture. I probably should look it up and post it or something. You can find it. But it was, um, 
but it so captured this. The only thing in the world that mattered to him in that moment was getting the nose of the football to break the plane and thereby give them the score that would have put them in the Super Bowl. Uh, it was... Uh, um, it was dramatic. It was a thousand words in that picture, but it all spoke to this one thing I do. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, most of us, frankly, don't often think of our Christian faith in terms like that. It's part of who we are. We go to church, we have fellowship, we maybe participate in ministry. We are looking forward to seeing Jesus one day, but still there is sort of this sense that it's part of what we do. It's, it's among the most important parts of who we are. Uh, our, our life walking with Jesus is really, really important, but yet there is so easily, for all of us, myself included, distractions that sort of get in the way where this priority sort of becomes behind a few others periodically in that. Paul here is speaking of a, of a, of a mindset that is so completely, thoroughly, utterly, absolutely driven toward this upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I am in awe of just the words, much less the commitment, but that commitment was born out in his life, wasn't it? Uh, he, was, uh, he went from being among the most ardent opponents of Christianity to becoming the church's greatest in the history of the church, I think even still. I, I am not sure if, you know, prove me wrong, hashtag whatever, you know, but. Uh, greatest church planter, evangelist, um, author, preacher, all of, just, you know, a church plant, did I say church planter already? Just all these different things that he did that so exemplified his unwavering commitment uh, to that which Christ had called him to. Uh, I admire that. I absolutely am in awe of that kind of thing. And when I see a passage like this, it, this is Paul expressing how he views what it means to be a Christian. Uh, this one thing I do, expressed out of the depth of his deep desire to know Jesus, this one thing I do, press a straining forward to what lies ahead, forgetting what was behind, I press on toward the goal, the goal, again, one singular goal, of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He considers this to be a prize, um, you know, for, for many of us, it seems like kind of a crazy sort of, okay, fringe level of, you know, commitment to something. No, this is what Paul sees as absolutely natural as a believer. He is so driven toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, and, and so he says, let those of us, as it continues in verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. Okay? In other words, let it be that as we grow in our relationship with Christ, as we mature in Christ, that we become more and more focused this way. In other words, we don't get used to being a Christian and sort of let uh, and just sort of lose our fervor and passion over time because after all, we've been at this thing for such a long time. It's kind of rote now. No, it's, it's as we become more mature. Let this be the way it's expressed. Let us be so driven as we walk longer with Jesus to be more hyper-focused on him and his upward call. Um, it, is, uh, it, is, it is a life of such love and passion for Jesus that everything else must fall behind it uh, or have some part to play in it. And I would suggest that all things in life that are good from God can fit into this, but they ultimately become good and, 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 and really the gift of God they were intended to be when they find attachment to this, when this is the priority and those things come alongside of it. Um, so lo let those who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. In other words, if there's some area of your life where this is not the case, God will show you. Don't worry. He'll tell you. He'll point it out. The question will be, will we listen to that? Will we respond to it as he would have us to? Um, only let us hold true to what we've attained. In other words, let us not waver, but let us hold firmly to that which we have arrived at. Now, brothers, join in imitating me, Paul would go on to say in verse 17, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. As he has said elsewhere, and, and, and I'm realizing, just it's kind of occurring to me how much he actually says this, 
the idea of, look, watch how I'm doing this so you can learn and grow thereby. Uh, all believers should be able to say this. All followers of Jesus should be able to say to younger believers, to those that we're investing ourselves in, look, let me demonstrate what it means to follow Jesus. Well, in Paul's mind, that means this one thing. I do. Learn from me in this, Paul is saying. Um, uh, according to the example you have in us, for by contrast, many of whom they have, whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. There are those who, and it breaks Paul's heart to acknowledge it and to think of these people who are actually walking as enemies of Christ, which means they are walking in opposition to what Jesus is saying to do. Now, there are those who are overtly in opposition to what Jesus says, but let me let me just attach contextually, um, you know, as Paul is encouraging believers not to waver, let me, let me uh, connect with that, the idea that even as believers, we can find ourselves putting things in front of our relationship with Christ or in front of that upward call of God in Christ Jesus that sort of distract us away from it. And if we are setting that model for others to watch, we are teaching them the same. Now, I'm not going to say that makes us enemies of Christ and the cross, but we don't even want to get in the way of that moving forward that Jesus is drawing us to. We don't want to stand as an example of anything less than the full commitment, this one thing that I do, kind of a mindset. Um, but here he goes on to talk about those who are full-blown enemies of the cross, and notice what he says their condition entails. He says their end is destruction. That is the, the end of where they're going. He says, their God is their belly, their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Okay? They are heading down the road to destruction because these th three things are true. Their God is their belly, their flesh, their earthly desires become that which sits on the throne of their hearts. Um, Moody once said, you can tell more about somebody by their checkbook than you can by their prayer book. And what he simply meant by that is that it's one thing to sort of, uh, you know, be kind of spiritual and praying and things like that. But if the course of your life, as and he saw very clearly that one of the best ways to sell to tell what people consider most important is where they spend their resources. In his case, he was describing money, but you could say just the same about money, time, all of those things. Where do we invest those things? Um, and if they are not invested in the kingdom of God, most often, I'm not saying you can't go out to dinner, you can't see a movie, but what I'm saying is that if the priority of your life can be demonstrated to be something other than Christ, then something else is on the throne of your heart. And in terms of the enemies of the cross, those whose gods are their belly, those who are in service to the flesh, uh, their end is one of destruction. Secondly, not only is their God their belly, but their glory is in their shame. In other words, they find glory in things that ultimately, from God's perspective, would be shameful to them. Uh, they, they revel in things that are of this world and are opposed to God. Why? Because they are natural like brute beasts, as Paul might say elsewhere. The idea is that their God is their flesh. Uh, and therefore, the things that they revel in, that they want to be attached with, the things they want to be associated with, are things that are, in fact, shameful. Um, you know, uh, I have often looked back on what my life was before I knew Jesus. And, you know, when I think about, like, if I had, if I had perished then, and if you could sort of look at what my life was summarized by, or the things that I might be remembered by then, uh, I would be horrified to think that that is what I would be best known for. Somebody might raise a glass in my honor for something that I would be ashamed to be remembered for now, because now I know what it means to walk with God. I know what it means to have a life that is truly rooted in meaning from an internal perspective. Um, if I perish today, I would like to think there would be other things that I could be remembered for that might honor the Lord and might not be shameful in any way. Um, but at that time, that would not have been the case. Those who live in that kind of a place find their meaning and their glory in those kinds of things, whether it's, um, you know, 
I won't even list, but just you can imagine. Um, but this is their glory. And then lastly, he goes on and says also, and again, this kind of ties that together, is that their minds are set on earthly things. They find their rest upon earthly things. They don't strive for anything more lofty. They have no interest in loftier things, except once in a while they might sort of get a glimpse of true glory and what, what truly is, is, is beautiful and right and good, but yet they are set on earthly things and so it quickly passes. It's not what they're about. This is what they're about, earthly things. And this ultimately, as he says, ends in destruction. But notice the contrast. This is the difference between that and what you and I are as believers. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. In other words, he will transform us. The, you and I groan to be clothed with glory. Uh, Paul speaks about this, um, this uh, beautifully and eloquently in Romans 7 when he talks about the inward struggle, this law in his members and his flesh that just does not allow him to live free of the sin that he knows he doesn't want to live in. Uh, it's funny, I, uh, Paul wrote Romans when he was about somewhere close to 30 years walking with the Lord. And I am about 30 years walking with the Lord, and I find tremendous solace in knowing that even after all that time, used of God as Paul was, he still acknowledged that there was this wrestling with the flesh. Uh, I don't glory in that truth that is also true in me, but I, I'm thankful to know that it is common to us, to all of us, to, to continue to struggle. But it is a struggle, and it's a struggle I want to leave behind. I don't want that struggle anymore, any more than Paul did. Hopefully any more than you do. We, we want that to be gone and over. We want to be liberated from it and given our glorified bodies where no longer will this, this dichotomous nature of ours, this flesh and spirit, no longer will, will have conflict because the flesh part will be gone. I want that so desperately, and so do you. And so did Paul, and so, did, so do mature followers of Christ, right? And Paul is saying, our citizenship is in heaven. You and I are in this world, as Jesus would say, but we're not of it anymore. Our citizenship is elsewhere, and we're looking for our king to come and get us and bring us home. That's the great and glorious hope. As Paul would say, this is the glorious, his glorious appearing, our great hope, the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking for this. We're looking for him. And because when he comes, he will transform our bodies into what they ultimately are going to be. And we will be free of this struggle. We will be absolutely, we will finally be in the place, position, condition uh, of perfection that allows us to enjoy and know God with all the depth that he intended us to know him. Um, and it is such a glorious thing to look forward to. And mature believers ought to seek this, ought to long for this, ought to ache for that day to come and for that experience to take place. He'll transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And there's so much that could be said about that. In the current context, though, I think Paul's primary thought is that of knowing just as we're known and to know him in that way. Therefore, verse one of chapter four, and this is where we'll stop today. Therefore, my brothers and sisters is implied there, whom I love and long for. Again, Paul's in prison when he writes this and he longs to see his brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Everything he was just talking about, stand firm in that. The days in which we live are days that can be overwhelmingly unsettling, but we are looking for the coming of our Lord. We are longing for the day that his kingdom comes. We are not expecting this world to get fixed. It's not going to get fixed. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not going to get fixed. It may have ebbs and flows, but ultimately this world is destined for what God has said it's going to, uh, is going to happen and what it's going to be. And in the same fashion as he has promised that the kingdom will come, 
you and I as mature believers ought to so long for that day that it becomes the single focus of our lives, looking for, longing for, walking toward, seeking to know better, um, being used for the purposes of that kingdom and that. But that one thing I do, I press on in spite of the obstacles. Matter of fact, think of that in terms of athletics for a moment. Paul does use sports analogies oftentimes. Uh, The idea here of pressing on toward that goal, struggling, straining, again, the football analogy, just get that ball across the plane. This we have to get there is the kind of mindset and determination involved in that. And that kind of mindset and determination by definition excludes all things that would curtail it. As a matter of fact, what did the author to Hebrews say? Let us therefore throw off all the weight of sin that so easily besets us. It weighs us down like ankle weights on a marathon runner. You might have to deal with that in preparation, but when it comes time to run, you throw it off so that you can run free and unencumbered. Uh, That takes devotion and dedication and single-mindedness, and that is what Paul, and again, as we've often said, not just Paul, but the Holy Spirit through his servant Paul, is expressing to us. So God help us to embrace that mindset, to be so driven for the kingdom of God that all other things fade away. If they don't fall behind, if they don't fit in, then they fall away. God help us to embrace and adopt that mindset, you and me both. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that uh, this is a lofty encouragement. This is something that um, that is maybe outside of how we typically tend to think of running our race. But Father, um, we need to see it as running our race, and we need to see it as, a, as the prize that we are single-mindedly running toward, that prize of that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us in our own hearts determine to say this one thing will I do. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that in the days to come, uh, I believe very soon, in the days to come, Jesus will come snatch us away. The time that we have left is valuable. It's meaningful. It's an opportunity. So use us, Father. Take hold of our lives and use us for your glory. Saturate our hearts and minds with a deep, overwhelming, overcoming desire to know you and to know you well and to settle for nothing less. Help us to pour ourselves into that relationship that Jesus poured out his blood to make available to us. Father, we love you. We thank you and praise you and ask for your help in this. By your Holy Spirit, empower us uh, to press on. Father, we love you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well. Thanks for watching as always, and um, please feel free to comment if you like or email if you want to reach out. Uh, You can comment here on our YouTube channel below the video. You can also, uh, if you want to send me an email, you can do that by going to our church's website at calvarychapelfranklin.com. And we always want to invite you to come out and join us if you're anywhere around the Franklin, Tennessee area. We're a little bit southwest of Nashville. And uh, if you're ever passing through or you live in the area and you're looking for a church to, 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 to come and study the word together, we invite you to come join us. Actually, this Sunday, we're going to be online only as my family and I get over COVID. Uh, but uh, uh, next Sunday, the 17th, we'll be back uh, in person again. And so we invite you to come join us then. Um, you can also watch these podcasts on a daily basis. I try to post uh, Monday through Friday. We actually missed Thursday this week, but uh, typically we're Monday through Friday. Uh, if you want to uh, email me on another way, you can uh, go to my website, my personal website, at parsonspad.com, and you can also subscribe to the audio podcast from there as well. So thank you so much for watching, and thanks for, uh, by the way, thanks for praying for us and, and the encouragements and the prayers and that as we, again, just, you know, we tested positive uh, just about a week ago, and so now we're just about getting through our quarantine in the next few days, and, uh, and uh, so looking forward to just kind of getting back with the body again. So, but thank you for watching. Thanks for your prayers. And we'll look forward to catching up with you again next time. So God bless you.